It is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. We're, today is our shift service. We're going to have a wonderful time. Our young people are going to lead us into worship today. And so we're going to lift our hands. We're going to worship the Lord. And let's just ask God to have his way in this service, shall we? Lord, we love you. And we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all your many blessings. God, we ask that you would touch us today and have your way in this service. Let your Shekinah glory fill this place today. We'll not fail to give you all honor, all glory, all power and praise. In Jesus' name, we praise you. We'll thank you. Come on, let's put our hands together and let's worship the Lord and sing unto him.
for he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of all of our praise. Hallelujah. Would you just lift him up and magnify him in this house today? Lord God, you are worthy. Jesus, we magnify you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> Last week, um, I talked a little bit about my AYC trip, and I promised that I would show pictures, um, and I had some technical difficulties, but everything worked out, and I have a presentation to show you today. I have a video, um, so if you, you know, wouldn't mind just watching with me. I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence, and I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again.
you have to excuse me. I get really emotional. <laughs> Since I got back from Hawaii, I've been really emotional, <laughs> which is weird. Um, that trip meant the world to me. Hawaii is a beautiful, beautiful place with beautiful people that love God people that are seeking God and he is moving tremendously in Hawaii and I'm so thankful that I was able to be there to experience it and I thank you all so much for giving me that opportunity I will forever forever be changed by that trip forever be changed so thank you Amen. Praise God. It was an honor and a privilege for my wife and I to be able to tag along with this Apostolic Youth Corps trip. And as you see, Sister Caitlin is very uh, 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 social, and you saw a lot of pictures with people that, uh, that she got to meet. And within just uh, eight, nine, ten days or so of meeting these people, you form uh, lifetime friendships with them. And one of the things that my wife and I enjoyed more than uh, traveling to the state of Hawaii and being able to look at all the beautiful scenery of God's creation and uh, his masterpieces of mountains and oceans and uh, all kinds of uh, different things there, uh, one of the things that we were blessed to be able to do were, was to invest in the lives of these students these young people and that meant more to us than it did to see uh, all of the beautiful landscape and uh, be able to go out and even uh, reach out to the state of Hawaii we were able to reach out and touch the lives of 54 young people from across North America and it was an honor and a privilege for us to be able to do that and there are several things and pictures that we weren't even to able to fit into this slideshow today, but pictures of these young people hard at work. You saw them with their Project 2239 shirts on, the, the bright lime green yellow shirts there. Uh, they worked very, very hard helping uh, churches out, and then there were countless miles walked, uh, passing out cards and witnessing to people, and countless hours going and uh, teaching and preaching and witnessing and reaching out to the people in Honolulu and other uh, areas of the state of Hawaii. And so it was definitely a privilege to be able to go. And what I would like to see is more of our FTC young people go next year to an Apostolic Youth Corps trip. And for our global trips, you have to be, I believe, uh, at least 16 or 17 years old to be able to qualify to go on a global trip but for one of our North American mission trips uh, if you're 15 but turning 16 within that calendar year you qualify to go on one of the North American trips and there are 11 destinations globally for 2017 and there are five North American destinations for 2017. So we want you to go check out apostolicyouthcore.com and you can find out all the information that you need for Apostolic Youth Corps in uh, 2017. And it is my honor today to launch our She's for Christ campaign. We have uh, about 30 days left before our She's for Christ sacrificial offering date this year. And we want to encourage you to give uh, to the Lord through uh, She's for Christ and through the missions and ministry of She's for Christ. And we have a unique, unique way of doing that. But let me tell you about She's for Christ just a little bit. She's for Christ is the fundraising ministry of the General Youth Division of the UPCI. And since its inception in 1952, over $106 million dollars have been raised to fund missions and ministries around the world. SFC 
is a missionary having the vehicle he needs to carry the gospel. He or she needs to carry the gospel to the furthest regions of their country. It's a North American missionary having a building so that they can share the truth in their community. It's a child finding healing and a future at Tupelo Children's Mansion or Lighthouse Ranch for Boys. It's a student pursuing his or her calling and Christian education with Sheets for Christ scholarships to attend a Bible college. It's families overcoming chemical dependency and finding restoration through Spirit of Freedom Ministries. When you invest and give to the cause of She's for Christ, you are intentionally sharing the gospel around the world. There are many of, his, of us here that have a desire to reach out and to evangelize this world to the uttermost parts of the earth, but we understand that God has given us a mission uh, and a calling here in our local city and community, but what we can do to evangelize the entire world is to give and invest, make an eternal investment in the kingdom of God into the mission of She's for Christ. Did you know that missionaries, the only way that they can purchase a vehicle is through She's for Christ funds? They go around deputizing and raising their budget to be able to go and be full-time in ministry uh, uh, in, in other countries, in other areas of this world, but they cannot, it is, uh, it is a uh, requirement they, or a rule, they cannot use any of their budget that they raise on deputation, uh, they cannot use any of that budget for a vehicle. So the only way that our missionaries, our global missionaries, are able to go and have the means of transportation is through your giving to She's for Christ. It not only buys cars and trucks, but it buys bicycles and motorcycles, and we even buy airplanes for those to go out there to travel to areas that a uh, boat or a, a, a a car or a truck or a motorcycle could not get to only by ways of an airplane and we have purchased one of those uh, and keep keep it updated as well and or, or keep it up keep keep the maintenance excuse me on that airplane on the engines and things like that so God is blessing and what we can do here in Conyers Georgia is to be able uh, to, to be a small part in giving and what we are wanting to do here is we're wanting to again have a competition between the men and between the ladies. Is there something about a friendly, good, godly competition between the men and the ladies? And what we have decided to do is we have envelopes here ranging from $10 to uh, $25 and uh, to $50, $75, and $100 here. And the ladies have a little pink uh, symbol on them, a little dot, dot there. And then the guys have the same amount of envelopes with the same uh, increments on there with a blue dot on them. And if you saw our She's for Christ uh, display in the back when you walked into the lobby today, Sister Caitlin uh, took care of this for us. And, and she did all the work to get this taken care of. And I appreciate the work that she invested. But... Um, there is a thermometer back there that is going to measure how much comes in from the girls and how much comes in from the guys. And so every week you will be able to know who is ahead. And so, guys, if the ladies get ahead next week, we got to make it up the next week and if vice versa the following week. And not only is it about raising funds for global missions to be able to purchase vehicles and transportation for those that are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around this world, but it also, a percentage of what we raise stays right here in the state of Georgia. And we are able to invest by giving uh, apost uh, AYC scholarships. We're able to put on camps and youth services and extreme weekend, all because of your giving to She's for Christ. And this is what helps the Georgia District Youth Department operate. It is also what helps the General Youth Division operate, which in 2017, we're going to be uh, making history and setting records because North American Youth Congress has 
outgrown any small stadium. And when I say small, I'm talking about a 20,000 person stadium. We have outgrown a stadium that will fit 20,000 people. And now in 2017, we as the young people of the United Pentecostal Church International, as apostolic Pentecostal young people, have now are renting football stadiums at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indiana, in Indianapolis, Indiana, because we are outgrowing. Folks, there is revival within our young people across the apostolic movement, and there are more young people. I got a report just this past weekend during some meetings that I, were, I was in, and we have at least seven campus ministries, and these are, are their CMI, Campus Ministry International, seven of those chapters all around uh, different college campuses on the state of Georgia. But what gets me even more is that we have over 30 Project 7 Bible clubs that have been started in the middle and high schools around the state of Georgia. And I'm proud to announce that Sister Caitlin, ba uh, excuse me, Sister Emily Bailey and uh, a few of her friends that are starting high school this year have already came and said, Pastor, we want to start a Project 7 Bible club in our high school. Would you help us do it? Absolutely. And so it funds ministries like Project 7 and CMI and Bible Quizzing and Hyphen and AYC. There's so many things that She's for Christ does. But most of all, all together, it is for the work of the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? And no matter who uh, raises the most money, uh, the guys or the girls, it is all for the kingdom of God. But I like the competition as well. And on August 28th, the last Sunday of August, we are going to be receiving uh, the final envelopes and receiving a sacrificial offering. That day is the National Sacrificial Offering Day for SFC. Last year, the Lord provided a miracle for us. And this church, uh, along with our daughter work, our campus in Jackson, were able to raise seven thousand dollars for the cause and mission of she's for christ praise god for that it was a miracle offering and this year i believe that we can do the same we're shooting to not only match it but go above and beyond uh giving uh the seven thousand dollars to she's for christ and we want your help we want you to help us and so in just a moment we're going to uh do our meet and greet because we haven't forgot about that. I like going around shaking everybody's hands and greeting everybody. But during our meet and, greet, meet and greet, we want you to come and take a moment to come down and the ladies pick up an, an envelope and gentlemen pick up an envelope of whatever increment that you would like to give to She's for Christ. And you don't have to turn this in Wednesday or next Sunday, but uh, we want them all turned in by August 28th, the last Sunday of August. And if you would like to get more than one envelope, if you would like to give $100 a week for the next few weeks or, or $10 or, or $50, however you would like to do, just get that many envelopes and commit to giving that to the cause and mission of She's for Christ. And you will see on these envelopes that there are pictures of missionaries here. And what I want you to do not only only is give whatever increment you commit to give that is labeled on the envelope but I want you to specifically for the next 30 days pray for the missionaries that are on your card if you would pray for them pray that God would help them and protect them and provide their needs pray for them they they, they say every time they go around for deputation God is able to provide them the finances that they need but what they need overall is prayer from the people of God, from the people of the body of Christ. So we want you not only to give, but we want you to pray for the missionaries. There's pictures of missionaries, their names, and what region they are missionaries to, and we want you to have special prayer for them every day for the next 30 days that God would help them. Are you with me? Amen. Let's all stand together. I thank you so much for being a giving church. And we don't ever have to beg and pull and plead with you, but you give out of the goodness of your heart and to support the calls and missions of She's for Christ and what it does globally and in North America and here locally and what it does for people here, right here in this church. Thank you so much for your giving. You may step out of your pews, shake someone's hand, greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ, and come and receive one of these envelopes. God bless you.
amen, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you. You may make your way back to your seats and be seated. And we are going to continue on with our worship service today. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here worshiping the Lord with us today. FTC, could we give all of our guests a hand clap of appreciation for being here today? Amen. Thank you so much. We love you and appreciate you. And we are so glad that you have decided to come and worship the Lord with us today in spirit and in truth. We're excited about uh, what is happening today. Today is our shift youth service, and our youth are singing and uh, leading us in worship, and there's a sign team that's going to be uh, taking place in just a little bit, and we've got several young people involved, and today is the day that they shift from uh, one class to another, depending on their age and their their group or what, uh, if they're in middle or high school, what grade level that they are in, and so we're going to be doing the shift presentation in just a little bit, but before we do that, we're excited about what God is going to do uh, beginning next week here at FTC. We are launching next week uh, two worship service Sunday, 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., and we're looking forward to what God is going to do. We understand that traditionally here in the south, the southern states and the what they call the Bible Belt, people on Sunday mornings, they have a routine of waking up getting dressed and going to church, and then having the rest of their day to uh, do whatever that they would like to do. And it has been a custom for us uh, over 12 years ago, I believe, is when we made a transition to go to a 1 o'clock p.m. service, and it has worked very well for us over the past 12 years. And so that's why we're not getting rid of the 1 o'clock service, but what we're doing is trying to expand our territory and our borders and trying to involve and reach out to those who a 1 o'clock service would not fit into their schedule. We could make the excuse and uh, the argument of, well, if they were truly dedicated, if they really wanted to come to church, then they would come at whatever time we had church. But you know what? Those aren't the kind of people we're trying to reach. We're not trying to reach the ones that are already dedicated, already committed. We're trying to reach those that need to dedicate their life to the Lord and need to commit their life uh, to serving God. And so what we're doing is creating another worship opportunity for them to experience the loving power of Jesus Christ and the power of the new birth. And what we want to do is uh, involve as many people as we can, but understand that our plans are to do these back-to-back -back services, a 10 a.m., 1 p.m. service, and they be the same service, and we'll sing the same songs, preach the same message, but ultimately we're going to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. And so however the Lord decides to move uh, on the singing and on the preaching and on the worship experience, that's what we're going to do because we are led uh, by the Word of God, by Spirit and in truth. And we do everything decently and in order. I believe that the Lord blesses an orderly church and uh, a church that does things decently and in order, but most of all a church that is sensitive to see and hear and follow after the Spirit of God. Can you say amen? So we're going to be putting up a new sign today, actually, and it will show the new service time, Sunday uh, worship service, 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., and then our Wednesday evening Bible study service will continue to be at 7.30 p.m. every Wednesday evening. And everyone said amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to ask our ushers to come as we prepare to receive our Sunday tithe and offering. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6, 38, and somebody declare the Bible. Amen. We know it to be the unfailing Word of God. We stand on the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, the Bible says, but my Word, the Lord is telling us that His Word will never pass away. And we are a church that's founded on the rock of Jesus Christ. And that we understand that as His church, as His body, the body of Christ, the gates of hell shall never prevail against us. 
They are doing everything to come against us, and they do come against us, but the Bible declares that we have the protective promise that the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. Aren't you thankful for the protective promise of Jesus Christ today? Can you say amen? Amen. We want you to give as unto the Lord today. Let's bow our heads and pray over this offering. Mighty God, we love you. We praise your name. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're continuing to do. God, you're so great and greatly to be praised. And we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and to worship you in our giving. Today, Lord, we pray that you would bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone together said amen. Amen. God bless you as our ushers serve you this afternoon. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with all of you today. And everyone said amen. Amen. Last week we did not get a chance, but we are so glad to have the Rossers back in Georgia with us. Brother, uh, <laughs> Brother Jonathan and Sister Lisa and their family. We miss them. They have been working out in Texas. And we thank them for all that they do. And, but we sure did miss you guys, and we're so glad that you guys are home. At this time, Brother Tim and Sister Sarah have an announcement they need to make. Praise the Lord, church. Uh, we're just going to make a pretty big announcement, um, something we've known for a little while now. But uh, here in seven months, we will have a new addition to the Harville family and a new addition to Faith Tabernacle. So we thank you guys for all your support and all that uh, you've done for us all this time. And uh, we just pray that you keep us in prayer and uh, everything will be all right. Let's give them a hand. We're excited for Brother and Sister Harvell. Amen, amen. Brother Tim doesn't say much, and he doesn't, he's not really as active as Sister Sarah, but we appreciate what the Harvells do for Faith Tabernacle. And everyone said amen. Amen. We want to go to the Lord together in prayer. We want to pray for Brother Jacob George. He is uh, having seizures, and he needs healing in his body. And so we want to pray that God would just touch him. Also, we want to pray for the Clark children for salvation and direction in their lives. I want to pray for Brother Devin Patterson has a migraine headache. So we want to touch, ask God to touch him. And then Ruin, I hope this is pronounced, uh, Johnson uh, was overtaken with a weakness and fatigue of an unknown origin. So we want to pray that God touches them as well. Also, we want to pray for Sister Patterson. She is at home still having some issues with her back she's getting better and so we're thankful for that but we just want to pray that god would just touch her if she's able to watch sister patterson we miss you and we completely understand why you're not able to be here but we're just praying that god would touch her as well and everyone said amen amen if you have a special unspoken request you can signify it by the uplifting of your hands god knows what they are if i could ask you to stand all across the building if you have a special need, you would like the ministry to pray for you, you can come down and we'll be glad to do that. But let's just take all of these needs before the Lord, shall we? Lord, we love you and we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for all your many blessings. 
God, we ask that you would touch us tonight. Touch us today, Lord. Have your way in, in the remainder of this service. We felt your presence so strongly already. We ask that you would touch all of these needs. Touch those that are sick. Let your healing virtue flow through their bodies, God. We know you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh within us, Lord, we ask that you would just move on us. In Jesus' name, we'll praise you and we'll thank you. Amen and amen. Continue to stand and worship as they sing.
Clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for the presence of God that we feel in this place? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. What a tremendous job. Good job, guys. Good job. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Amen. At this time, we're going to move into the time of, of our shift service where we do our presentation with our young people. And what I would like to do is I would like all of our young people from our all-star age all the way through hyphen, if you would come and let's start with all-stars down on this end. Would you come at this time, all-stars and, and uh, Sister Sarah and our teachers here, would you come with them as well? Come on this, just line across the front here, face Face the audience here. Face, face your parents and friends and the church. Amen. And then any of those that are in our refuge student ministry, our middle and high school students, would you come right here? Would you come at this time? Our refuge uh, student ministry, middle and high school students, come over here. Amen. 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 
Praise God. And then any of our hyphen age young people, uh, young adults, I should say, would you come over here onto this side? And the, our hyphen are those that are high school graduates, 18 years up to 30 years old, single young adults. If you're between the 18, eight years of 18 years and 30 year old, single young adults, would you come and just stand down here to our left here? Praise God. Look at this. Y'all scoot down just a little bit, guys. Scoot down just a little bit so we can fit everybody up here. There you go. Scoot down just a little bit. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Moving on up. Let's go. There you go. Come on, scoot, scoot this way a little bit. There you go. There you go. Good, good, good job. Amen. Don't we have a tremendous uh, group of student ministry and children ministry uh, young people here at FTC? We can, can we give them a hand clap of appreciation? Amen. 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 And what I would like to do at this time. Uh, first off, we have our all-star teacher who is now uh, two months, expecting now or so, two and a half months. Aren't we excited about little Harvell that is on his or her way to the, this church and this family, wonderful young couple here. We're excited about that. And um, we have some little stars. Where are our little stars at? Little stars, would you come and join me? Uh, guys, I'll tell you what, s let's split the waters here a little bit. Split that way. There you go. Let's split the Red Sea just a little bit there. There we go. Little stars, come here. Come and join me right here. All of our little stars, little stars. There you go. Come stand right here next to me. There you go. All right. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> come on, Logan. You ready? Come on. Come see me, Bubba. Come see Daddy. Uh, or hang on to the organ. Either way. Either way. Is she a little star, or is she going to go down to a, a sibling? Okay, a little star. Amen. So we've got little stars. This is not all of them. We've got one little star over there hanging on uh, for dear life on the leg of the organ. And go figure, that's my son there. The, uh, and then we have other little stars here that are in the arms of family members here. And what little stars is, is after they move out from nursery, Nursery goes from our infant age, age I believe it's uh, six weeks, all the way up to four uh, th or three years old. And then when they turn four years old or they go into K-4, because uh, we like to do things by grade levels here, is K-4, they go um, into our little stars. And so since school is starting back and these young people have either already been in K-4, they're going to K-5. They're going to be in little stars from K-4, uh, K-5, and is it first or K-4 and K-5? K-4 and K-5 are our little stars. So can we give all of our little stars a hand clap of appreciation? Amen. And our teachers include Sister uh, Peacock and, well, and Sister Peacock. <laughs> Sister Angie Peacock and Sister Chris Peacock, they do a tremendous job. They come up under the umbrella of our All-Stars, which Sister Sarah Harvell is our director of. But we're glad that they do a Little Stars for our K-4 and K-5 uh, young ladies and young men. Amen? Amen. All right, you guys can go back over there with Sister Sarah. Hang out there or wherever you would like, son. Now, all of our All-Stars, with our All-Stars that are in first through fifth grade would you come and hang out with me just for a second right here on the platform there you go amen look at these young men and young ladies coming over here praise god amen we love our all-stars here and a great range of them that are some of them are coming out of k-5 and going into first grade and we're glad to have our first through fifth graders represented here today would you give them a hand clap of appreciation we love them very very much amen god bless you now you can go sit uh, or stand back there with sister sarah amen and then we have our refuge student ministry which is middle school and high school sixth through 12th grade but I would like to know who is moving up from middle to high school. Would you raise your hand real quick? Look at the middle school students going up to high school. And, uh, and then how many of you are coming out of elementary going into middle school? How many? 
Sister Kara, where are you at? Come on over here. It's time for you to shift over here to the Refuge Student Ministry. Amen. And Tristan. Amen. Tristan is shifting out of elementary school into uh, middle school, elementary to middle. And we're glad to have both of these young people graduating and shifting over. Amen. I tell you what, let's make this official. Why don't you guys go down right here? And just kind of go across the line. And all of you that are in the refuge ministry, how about you welcome them with a handshake and a hug around the neck? Go ahead. Go ahead. Walk down. Walk down. Walk down. There you go. There you go. Amen. We're glad to have them. Guys, your sister is finally caught up with you in the youth group here. Amen. Amen. And so we're thankful that they are going to be part of the youth group now. Praise God for that. So then we have those that went from elementary to middle, middle to high. And are there any of those that are graduated? This is your senior year this year. Any seniors in the house? Any seniors? Any se None? Uh, what about um, juniors? All right. Going into 11th grade there. Congratulations for that. Only uh, another year or so be, uh, before you enter into our hyphen. And so we got our middle and high school students here. And then we have our hyphen age young adults here that are 18 to 30 year old single young adults. And they do a tremendous job because they've, they've worked their way through uh, their years of life all the way from the nursery, and little stars, all stars. Uh, middle and high school and now they're young adults and they are taking the lead and helping us lead all of these the rest of these young people I believe they deserve a hand clap of appreciation and thank God for what they are doing here at this church we couldn't do what we do in youth ministry without those young adults there and I'm very thankful that God is using them and uh, leading them along the way and now uh, after the all-stars and uh, our youth group here uh, I would like to recognize our CDC. Could I have all of our CDC teachers come and join me right here in the front? All of our Christian development class teachers, would you come and join me here in the front? A and not only the teachers, but our director and assistant as well. Why don't you come on down and help us here? Brother Billy Marzalek is our CDC uh, director, and we're glad to have Brother C uh, Billy Marzalek with us. And Brother Dustin Hewitt is our assistant CDC director, and he's making his way down. He is a multitasker today, helping in the sound room and in the media there. And so Brother Billy and Brother Dustin help lead this group. And then starting with the youngest class, who, which one is the youngest class here? Sister Tasha and oh, Sister Tasha, and then Natasha. What age group do you have? Okay, so K4, K5, and first grade. And then Sister Natasha has uh, up through from that to fourth, fourth grade or so. And then they transition over into Sister Rosie's class, which is third, fourth, and fifth. So, yeah, we have, we have, the, have it mixed up right here. But we know they've got basically the kids. They have the kids K4 through second grade. There we go. K4 through 2nd, and then we have 3rd grade up through 5th grade. And then we have Brother Cleo Etsky and Brother Timothy Harvell helping us out starting from 6th grade and up to 12th grade. And so what I would like to do, all of those young children that are moving into our K4 through 2nd grade, would you come and hang out here with Sister Tasha and Natasha? Would you come and do that real quick if you're listening? If you're not, it's okay. You know, and then those that are going from Sister Tasha and Natasha's class and going into Sister Rosie's class, would you come and hang out with her right here? Praise God. Amen. We got a, a few more. Who? Oh, Carly and Belle are also uh, transitioning out of the younger class into Sister Rosie's class. Come and hang out with her, guys or girls. Amen. And then do we have any, Sister Rosie, that are transitioning from your class up? Who is that? All right. These two right here. Why don't you all come over here and hang out with your new teachers here? Amen. And now we've shifted all of them around. Hopefully they can remember where they go. If not, on Wednesday night, we'll tell you again which class they need to go in. What we do here at FTC is 
on alternating Wednesday nights, we have our Christian development classes, and then the alternating Wednesday night, our youth services. And so one night, uh, we will have all of our teachers in separate classes out in the mobile units teaching our young people. And then the other Wednesday night, we will have our youth service and all-stars. And so we are so thankful, not only for the young people, but I am very thankful for all of the CDC teachers and the youth teachers and all-star teachers. Let's give all of them a hand clap of appreciation for what they do here to train up our children in the way they should go. Amen. Amen. And at the end of the service, we're going to call you back down here to have a word of prayer over you. But we're excited about what God is doing in your life, young people. And we believe in every single one of you. How about you turn around and look at Pastor just for a second? Turn around and look at Pastor here. I believe every single one of you have a tremendous future ahead of you. But your future is only as bright as it can be when you're in the will of God and when you're serving Him and when you're walking after truth and righteousness. And I want to challenge you today as your teachers and our staff are here to help you. We want you. We're going to teach you on your level and we're going to tell you the truth and we're going to worship together and we're going to pray together. We're going to have fellowship together and we're going to do all of these things together because if it wasn't for these elders and for those that uh, are now grown and they're adults and have families of their own, we wouldn't be here. And I am very thankful for all of our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who always make a way for these young people to come to the house of God and to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let's give all of our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, family members, a hand clap of appreciation. Thank God for them. And we want to challenge you to get involved in whatever area that you can. I know Sister Kara has been waiting. She's been uh, just right there on the edge. When can I join the choir? When can I get involved and, and sing and all this? Well, Sister Kara, I'm glad to tell you after today or today, you can get involved now uh, because you're out of all stars in the youth group. And you too, Tristan, we want you to be involved in singing and worshiping the Lord with us. And what we try to do, we tried at one time, as soon as they came out of all stars, we tried to let them be assistants and helping in all stars. That didn't really work. Because some of our kids were still thinking that they were just their friends and they weren't leading or assisting. So what we've done is that in middle school, they can start involving themselves in the adult choir and, and singing and doing things like that. But then once they go into high school, then we give them opportunities to go back and minister and teach. And Brother uh, Nevin does, teaches in All-Stars now. Who else helps teach in All-Stars? Any, any of, of our other... Where are we at? Carissa, where's Carissa? There's Carissa helps teach in all stars. Now is that that it of this group right here, Sister Sarah? And so they are helping. And then we've got these young men and young ladies who are involved in the choir and singing. And what a great voice they have. And I'm excited about helping them grow up and develop their talent for the kingdom of God. And we can only do this with your help. And so uh, together, we can make a difference in the lives of these young people. These young people have bright futures and a great future ahead of them if we will do our job and invest in them and teach them the right way and train them up in the way that they should go. For the Bible declares that they, when they are older, they will not depart from it. And I believe right now we need to stand in appreciation and give the Lord a hand clap of praise for what God is doing and what He's going to continue to do in the lives of of our young people. Praise God for them. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Young people, you may make your way back to your seats. And we're going to ask the sign team to come at, uh, or excuse me, the youth praise team to come back at this time. They have another song that they would like to sing. And then we'll have a sign team. And we want you to worship the Lord together with us as they sing. God bless you all. Lord. This song is so beautiful. Um, I've heard it for a while. I just never really paid attention um, to the words. A lot of times you hear a song and you think it's pretty and you hear the melody and you're like, yeah, you know, that's beautiful. Um, 
But when Jameson said he wanted to do this song, I really started listening to it, and I started looking at the words, and it's so detailed. Um, It says, I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. That is huge, that we find our strength in God every day because he paid the ultimate price. He made the sacrifice for us to be where we are right now. So if you will just worship with us as we sing.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated at this time. Our sign team is making their way up here. We appreciate all of our young people working so diligently and hard to, uh, to minister to us. But let's just worship with our little our uh, youth sign team. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a moment, if I may. This was actually Sister Emily's idea. She came to pastor and told him that she wanted to do something for our shift service, and she has put this all together. She's planned it. She planned all the practices. She got it all together. So let's give her a hand clap for her hard work and her diligence. God bless them as they minister to us. Come on all over the room, lift your hands and give God praise. We feel him in the room tonight. Come on and give him glory. All over this place, open your mouth and bless him. We feel him in the room. Come on, Jason. Lord, I feel you here. You're in the atmosphere. Your presence is here. I'm desperate for you, Lord. I'm thirsty, I need more. I need your power, Lord. I need you. And I feel you moving. I feel you moving. Move.
Come on, let's give them a hand clap of appreciation. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen, amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our all-stars. Our all-stars can be dismissed. They've been waiting waiting patiently. Thank you so much. God bless you. You may be seated. The Lord is good. Amen. 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 We're about to move on in our service. We thank you so much for your patience. We know we've had a lot going on. I have been teaching the young people for years and I've never been more sure that we have an awesome group of young people that has so much potential I am tired of hearing the world tell us that our young people aren't worth anything they're not worth investing in I totally disagree I totally think that this is the church of tomorrow that's going to carry us on into the future millennium and I am so excited and so happy and so thankful and I am that our future is bright but it's bright because we've had people that invested in us. It's, it's bright because we've had people that poured themselves into us. I remember as a young child, I would want to be involved, and I was too young. And, and then I grew up in a generation that says, oh, they're not worth investing into. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. My son is singing songs that I had no idea that he knows, but it's choir music. It's, it's Jesus loves me. I, I've never taught him that, but... He, he sang it Wednesday night on the way to church. I mean, just they're worth investing into. But because they are worth investing to, into, it's because we were worth investing into. And it was people like Dr. Harper, people like Brother Joe Patterson, Brother Clay Eskew, our bishop, that has allowed us, a younger generation, I'm a little bit older than Pastor, but I consider myself his generation, but it's all because of these great men putting into us and allowing us to get up here and can't preach ourselves out of a wet paper bag but yet you worship with us and you got behind us and people like you that have allowed us as young people to give back to you and to show you 
It hasn't been in vain. It has not been in vain. We still love God. We still believe that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We still believe that God robed himself in flesh and came to earth and died on a cross. We still believe in holiness and separation from the world. So thank you, our older generation, for investing in us. And now we get the honor to invest in our young people. At this time, Dr. Harper has a letter he would like to read. And this is so such an honor. But it is my honor to introduce a great man that I have the utmost respect for. Come, Dr. Harper, and share with us. I'm not easily impressed, folks, but what you youngsters have done today is impressive. Y'all have done really, y'all done good. Really have done good. Done done a wonderful job. Brother Scott Peacock is very gifted in a number of things and one of those is mimicking folks and uh, I was his first uh, victim uh, <clears throat> and not only did he uh, catch my, my verbiage and uh, my articulation but he also kept, caught my gesticulations that I do and I was watching the, the sign team going through all of that and thinking, wow, look at all of that that they are saying with their hands as as they bring that to us. And it was really, they they were just really, really impressive. Um, I'm here to read something and make a presentation, and I'll do this uh, R.A.P. right now. William Shakespeare, uh, the guy that most all of us had to read in, in high school, and we read his words and wondered, what in the world is he saying? And the teacher wanted us to extrapolate from that all of these great things. And we finally got through that. One of the things he wrote is, consistency, thou art a jewel. Consistency is not flamboyancy. Consistency is not, hey, look at me. Consistency is not bringing yourself to the stage and, and, and pointing other things to yourself. Consistency is that thing that um, when other people aren't there to do it, uh, consistency is there. Consistency is not selfish. Consistency, when it rains, they're there. Consistency is when the sun's shining and it's hot. Consistency is when it's cold. Consistency is there. When nobody else wants to do, consistency is there. That's what makes consistency a jewel. And without consistency, and uh, Brother Ashley was very kind to speak with reference to us, but we, and I, and Dr. Patterson and I are in the same group. He told me before church he wanted me to read this. He, want, he said, I wanted somebody who was kind of antiquated. I said, thank you very much. I said, I don't feel antiquated. He said, you know, I'm kidding. I said, yeah, I know, but you're older than I am. But, <clears throat> but there were people who were there for us who taught us and allowed us to learn how to preach out of a wet paper bag, who put up with the things that we said, the mistakes that we made, and they were there for us. And it's an, it is a privilege and an opportunity to be in a facility, in a, in a local assembly, and be given the opportunity to do the things that, that we do with reference to you all. It is my honor to read this letter and make this presentation to you. And this is ref- in reference to uh, uh, Pastor Michael Patterson. I watched him grow up uh, around here. Uh, I had the opportunity to be his teacher uh, with reference to the oneness of God. And Dr. Patterson and I would talk, and he said, you know, Michael finished this last session in class, and he came to me and said, Poppy, I don't understand this. He said, just hang in there, just hang in there. And several weeks later, he came by and said, I got it now. He said, I told you, wouldn't he? He said, just hang in there. He still allows me to give him things that God gives to me for him on an individual basis, but for him as a pastor for all of you. And it's very humbling to do that. So with no further ado, let me read this letter that was addressed August 1st, 2016 to Michael Patterson. Dear Brother Patterson, I am writing on behalf of the United Pentecostal Church International to express how much we appreciate your faithful service and devoted ministry. In March 2005, 
the general board of the UPC decreed that we would rec congratulate you on this important milestone. That was 11 years ago, folks. Each minister, uh, as you know, our country gives honor to its war heroes. Those who have served in any branch of the military are appropriately provided with military honors in recognition of their exemplary service and their personal courage under fire. Each minister in the UPC qualifies for special regard and to have his or her ministry and service brought into focus. Those who do not often appear in the limelight or whose ministry is relatively unknown do not depend on their rank or position to define their self-worth. Nevertheless, every minister among us is important in God's sight. We give value to our roots and to the faithful pioneers of our past. We also value those who currently serve and have fellowship with us. We recognize your staunch and unwavering commitment to the message and to the ministry. It is my hope that this recognition will fill you with a sense of destiny and will remind you of the appreciation of the United Pentecostal Church International has for you personally by acknowledging our own heroes of the faith not only for their achievements, but also for their faithfulness, we will strengthen generations to come. Sincerely in Christ, the General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International, David K. Bernard. And with that, a certificate a, uh, came. Ministry milestone, honor to ministers who provide our heritage in appreciation for 10 years of service and association, Michael Patterson. Special thanks from your fellow ministers and saints of God who have shared the blessing of these wonderful years of ministry. Brother Patterson, it is my honor and privilege to present this to you. On behalf of the United Pentecostal Church and your church, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you. you. may be seated. Our bishop is going to come in just a moment and share the word of the Lord with us. And uh, it is a privilege and an honor. I'm only 30 years old, and uh, I can't believe that I've already been uh, licensed and associated with the UPCI for 10 years now. And it's an amazing thing, and I'm very thankful for uh, the words of Dr. Harper, and they're very humbling and I appreciate you allowing me to do what God has called me to do and do it effectively, efficiently, and we are standing on the rock. There is only one God, and his name is Jesus, and everyone that wants to go to heaven must experience the power of the new birth in water and in spirit, born again of the water and of the spirit, to be able to see and enter the kingdom of God. And that's what we preach and teach, holiness and righteousness and an unwavering faith that will last uh, in these end times. I'm thankful to be a part of this end time generation. The Lord is coming back, folks, and we must be ready. But I want not only to be ready myself, but I want to help other people be ready and preach and teach the Word of God and, uh, and give you what the Lord has given to us. Thank you. This is such a tremendous honor. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. One last time, if you can stand, would you stand for the reading of the Word of the Lord? I realize we've had a lot going on, and uh, did not Emil and Bailey just rock our boat? My goodness. My goodness. I appreciate that so much. She is a rising star, and uh, there's no telling what this young girl is going to do. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Uh, yesterday, she was a baby, and today... Here she is doing this, and our other young men, and this is our youth department. They don't do things exactly like us, but we don't expect them to, and, uh, but here they are in us. And uh, Brother Jameson, all those others that worked up here today so hard, I appreciate what they did so very much. And I wrote Brother Michael a note, said this, these young people are the church of tomorrow today. They're not going to wait till tomorrow to be the church. They're the church of tomorrow today. They already are the church. So we thank you for being with us today. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with us to the book of 
Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. If you do not have your Bible, it will be on the screen for you. I have a message that will not be a long message because I anticipated a lengthy service, not to minimize the Word of God, but to uh, honor your time and appreciate the fact that you're with us today. I don't know, I want to recognize a good friend of mine, Tennyson Knight, uh, is here with us today. Tennyson's father and I grew up together in Porterdale. And he was a very, very good friend of mine, although we fought nearly every other day. And his daddy would regularly bloody my nose. And one time I got a lucky punch in and blooded Tennyson's nose, and I felt so good about it. But after a while we grew up and we realized that being friends was better than being in a fight. So we became solid friends and we're friends until he passed away. I talked to him a short time before he passed away and told him that I loved him. I said, I don't expect you to answer me, Tennyson, because this sounds funny coming from somebody, another man, but I want you to know I love you, son. I always have. And he didn't say much. He said, okay. <laughs> but we're glad to have you, Tennyson. Raise your hand back there. This is him, folks. Glad to have Tennyson tonight with us. Amen. From the Word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now. Everybody say now. now. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Age will take a toll on everyone. But the admonition from the preacher of Ecclesiastes is, remember now. Now, 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 when you're 16 and 14 and 21 and 22 and 12, remember, now, thy creator in the days of thy youth. Shall we pray? Lord, we're so thankful today for this opportunity again to come to you, speak to our hearts today from out of the word of God. We need to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say to us, and we pray, Lord, that you'll take my words and you will say more from them than I can say with them. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. And everyone together, say amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to speak for the next few minutes, primarily to our young people, but the principles I'm using here today will also apply to our General Assembly as well, so that you will not be left out of what I'm preaching about today. My message title for the message today is The Awesome Power of PCP. Now, phenocycladine, a drug that was once used as an anesthetic by veterinarians and was later illicitly taken to the streets for its effect as a hallucinogenic, originally it was used in the form of a powder or a dust. Some of the street names were angel dust or PCP. However, just so you will know, this is not the PCP that I'll be speaking about today. The PCP that I want to speak about today consists of three spiritual principles that are far more powerful and impacting than angel dust could ever be. They are, first of all, persistence. That is a relentless drive that does not quit. Second of all, courage. That is a stalwart drive that does not bow down, nor it is dissuaded, nor is it dissuaded by fear. And the third is passion, a consuming drive committed to a certain and specific purpose. Our text that I read to you today addresses both our young men as well as our young ladies. The scripture teaches us many things. One of them is that we do not own, that is, we do not have solitary rights to ourself. God has made us. He is our creator, and he has made us that we might enjoy the pleasures of life. But we can only enjoy life's pleasures to their fullest and know its real satisfaction as we know satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ has created us. God created us. He preserves us. He feeds us. He clothes us. He sustains us. He has created us with the capacity of knowing Him, of loving Him, of serving Him in this present world, 
and of also enjoying his glory forever in the world to come. When we fell in Adam and came under the curse of sin, God sent his son to redeem us by his own blood. He then sent his Holy Spirit to empower us and lead us away from vanity and triviality of selfishness and sinful pursuits as young people. We must always remember him as our creator and our affectionate and loving father. When we are young, our memory is strong and tenacious. But if we yield to sinful ways, then our hearts will be perverted, will become distracted and drawn away into a wayward living, and we will abandon our righteous effort to walk with God. If any of us receive a kindness from a friend, we will remember that and be grateful, and that person will be forever endeared to us. Now let me ask you this. Has anyone ever given us more kindness than our Creator? Our body and soul came from Him. He gave us eyes to see His glory. He gave us ears to hear the melody of His voice. He gave us a tongue to sing His praises. He gave us hands to lift Him heavenward. And He gave us our feet to carry the gospel to the lost and dying world. What a blessing these are. And how excellent and precious and how glorious are these blessings. And we must never, ever forget him for them. Remember thy creator in the days of our youth, says the preacher, that we may have a long and blessed life, that we may be saved from the corruption and misery into which so many of our young people fall and from the evils that ensnare and will utterly destroy our young men and women should they give in to sinful temptations. As young men and women, all the power of your senses are more active and vigorous. So a young person, as a young person, you are capable of the ultimate in faith, in hope, and in loving God. And you are and have the greatest of spiritual vigor when you're young. It will be much easier for you to believe and to hope and to pray and to love and to obey God and to bear your cross. So remember this, in your youth lies your golden opportunity. I want us to consider three examples of young people in the scripture who remember their creator in the days of their youth. First, I want to use John Mark as an example of persistence. John Mark was not without his failings, yet he absolutely refused to be a failure. Understand this, a failure doesn't make, a failing doesn't make you a failure. You are only a failure when you buy into the idea that you are a failure. Everybody fails at something. Just remember, it's not the fact of you, that you fail that will stop you from your goals. It's the fact that you wallow in your failure and you become a victim of self-pity and give up on yourself. Some theologians think John Mark could have been among the first streakers. I don't know if you knew that or not. The young man in Mark 14, 51 and 52 who fled naked from the betrayal scene in Gethsemane where Jesus was being arrested is thought by many theological historians to have been John Mark. And oh, what a shame it must have brought him. But he did not stop there. Even though it may have been that he ran from the garden because he was afraid. So much so that when they grabbed his clothing, he just gave them his clothing and kept on running. He did not let that embarrassing incident in his walk with God or in his desire to be a success with God. Our young people need to be tenacious enough to know that your failure does not have to be the epithet on your tombstone. You just need to remember everybody before you had a failure and everybody after you will have one. You just can't let it be the end of what you want to do for God. He was a companion of Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. 
in Acts 12, 25. But before the journey was actually over, he abandoned them and left early to go back home. He became known as the person who would not finish what he had started. That must have been another embarrassing moment for him. But if you notice, he did not stop here. When Paul and Barnabas were preparing for their second missionary journey, John Mark wanted to go, perhaps to redeem himself. But Paul refused to allow it. And the young man suffered an obvious blow to his self-esteem and his ego. It was embarrassing that someone so noble as Paul would not allow him to go on another missionary journey. It must have shamed him. It must have hurt him. But John Mark did not stop here either. Part of us, however, was a relative who had a tender spot for John Mark, and he took him and went another way to do the work of missions. And John Mark went along because he was just not willing to give up. If he couldn't have the number one slot, he was not too proud to take the number two slot. If he couldn't go with the Apostle Paul, he was not too, too, too proud to go with Uncle Barnabas. If, in fact, that was his uncle or his cousin or whoever it was, he was not too embarrassed to take another place where the first spot was not available to him. We need young people just that tenacious where if something doesn't work out for you, it cannot be the end of what God wants you to do in your life. You've got to remember, I will not be defeated. I am going to be determined. So this relative of Barnabas, former traveling companion of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, because of his persistence, his relentless drive that would not quit, he regained his footing. And over the years, years later, in 2 Timothy 4 and 11, the Apostle Paul, who wouldn't let him go before, said this to Timothy, Take Mark and bring him with you because it's profitable for me to have him in ministry. Did you catch this? That young guy, because he just would not lay down and die. He just would not roll over and play dead. His persistence would not let him stop what he was determined to do. And years later, it took a while to happen, but the apostle Paul set up and took notice and said, Timothy, if you can locate John Mark, be sure and send him in the company that comes over here because now I see something in him that's valuable. He is profitable to my ministry. Because of John Mark's persistence. The Apostle Paul, who once did not want him, is now telling Timothy, be sure and bring him because he is profitable to the ministry. John Mark's persistence brought him into a good place of maturity and to a place where God actually could use him and God used him to write the Gospel of Mark. The guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark was the guy who theological historians say ran naked from the garden because he was scared of those who were arresting Jesus. I don't suggest you do that. I'm just saying that from this shameful beginning, he got up and said, I just ain't going to quit. It just ain't in me to quit. I'm just not going to stop. Sometimes I think we have such fragile egos that our young people can be so easily hurt. I want to tell you to buck up, toughen up. Don't let the discouraging things that happen to you in your life set you back or knock you down or paralyze you or keep you from obtaining your goal. Remember that God is greater than any of your adversity. Persistence pays off. You young people look at somebody close to you and say, I'm persistent. I'm persistent. Say it again. I'm Persistent. Say it out loud, boys. Come on. I'm. My, my, my. Let's do it again. Boys, come on. All right, girls. Everybody. Persistence pays off. Secondly, I want to use David as an example of courage. The, and courage is a stalwart drive that does not bow down 
to, nor is it dissuaded by fear. It doesn't regard fear. It acknowledges fear. It says it's there. I feel it. I see it. But I will refuse to let fear be of consequence in my life. I'll just know that I'm afraid, but I'll know that it ain't going to make no difference. In spite of my fear. Historical theologians place David's age as young as 12, between 12 and 19, when he fought and killed Goliath. He would have been even younger than this when he fought the lion and the bear. Clearly, this young man had courage. How old are you, Emily? Bailey. 14. You're two years older than David was when he fought Goliath. I'm amazed at her already at 14 years old. David was younger than that when he fought the bear and the lion. However, with the lion and the bear, it was not a personal thing. They were just acting according to their instinct. They were hungry, and David was between them and a good meal. Not every trial we have is personal. Some challenges come just because we serve God. We don't need to, as young people, feel so intimidated and so pressed down upon because of the frequency of trials that we have in life. Maybe we have them in high school, in grade school, in our neighborhood, other places we go, we have these trials, and we think, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just poor little old me. No, some things come to you, and they're not personal. They just come to you because you've committed yourself to serve God. It's not a personal thing. It's not intended to just be you to signal you out of the pack and come after you. Understand that if you are going to serve God, you cannot think it strange concerning the fiery trials that will come upon you. I'm telling you, young people, we want you to be tough. We want you to be tough. But when David faced Goliath, it was more personal. Goliath said this to David in 1 Samuel 17, 44. Come on, buddy. Come to me. And I'm going to give your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, that was personal. There's some things in your life that are personal. There's some things in your life you're going to have to fight because you're you. Because you live where you live. You have the family you have. You go to school where you go to school. You're in the neighborhoods you're in just because you're you. Because maybe your personality draws some things to you. Just because you're you, you'll have some things to come to you. And they may be personal, but that is no reason for you to lose your courage. It doesn't matter whether it comes to you just because you're living for God or just because of some personal reason where you say, I feel like I will signal out. I feel like this was personally against me. It well could be. And if it is, so what? It's not the end of the world. David said that guy is not just concerned about getting Saul. He wants David. He's not just concerned about bringing down Israel. He's concerned about bringing me down. He wants to feed my flesh to the birds. Sounds personal to me. But it did not diminish the courage of David. David's courage was a spiritual courage. It wasn't that he may not have felt fear in all likelihood if he had a lick of sense. He had a little bit of fear. But he did not allow his fear to intimidate him or to suppress his courage. Rather, and more importantly, he understood that I am going to fight this giant. But it's not my power that will bring him down. And it's not my courage that will stand against him. I'm going to him. I'm a little bit leery. I'm a little bit afraid. But my courage comes from God. Because I'm not meeting Goliath in David's name. I'm meeting Goliath in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you in the name of the Lord. We want a tough generation of young people. We want you to be able to stand up and say, I'm not asking for a fight with the devil, but I'm telling you, if he comes, he comes. I'm not asking to be challenged, but I'm telling you, if I'm challenged, I'm challenged. 
I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I'm not going to break my arm, pat myself on the back. I'm not going to whimper. I'm not going to crawl off in a hole and say, woe is me. I'm going to eat worms and die. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to call my name out loud and say, this is me. I'm present and accounted for. If you want to come after me, come on. Because I'm coming back at you in the name of the Lord. I am courageous in God. I have the courage of the Holy Ghost. David's courage came not from what he knew about himself, but rather David's courage came from what he knew about God. He knew that this battle is the Lord's. Not my battle, it's the Lord's battle. So it's a big one, you got a big God. Say so it's a tough one, you got a tough God. Say so it's going to be a long battle. You got a long suffering God. Third, I want to use Jesus as an example of passion. Passion is a consuming drive that is committed to a certain and specific purpose. In Luke 2, 41 through 50, we find the story of Mary and Joseph accidentally leaving Jesus in Jerusalem. The past, it was the year of Passover, and this particular year, Jesus was 12 years old. And when his parents left Jerusalem, after the celebration was over, they assumed that Jesus was in their company. But when they were a day away from Jerusalem, they discovered that he wasn't there. So they traveled back to Jerusalem. And when they found him, he was in the temple, amazing the listeners with his knowledge. When his parents questioned him as to why he stayed behind, he simply said, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. I think perhaps Jesus said no more profound thing in his ministry or illuminating thing about himself than this one thing. Don't you know that the passion that drives this 12-year-old is to do the Father's business? I think one thing we need to do, we need to sell out to the business of the Father. If you haven't done it as a young person, you need to do it. Find yourself a place to pray. Do it at the altar today if you want to, but find yourself a place to pray and sell yourself out to Jesus Christ and say that I will have first and foremost a passion in my soul to do the business of the Father. It comes before anything else in my life. I will put no thing before I put my service to God. It doesn't mean you can't excel in other areas, you can't excel. And I believe that probably in this generation, we'll have young men and women who excel in areas of sports and things that we never have had in previous generations. But you cannot allow anything to come before your priority with God. You must make sure that I have designated my Lord and my God as my priority in life. Everything else falls in line behind my service to God. I have a passion to do the business of the Father. The passion of this young boy, Jesus. Now, there's a lot to preach about in the story that I just read to you. But my point today is this. At 12 years of age, Jesus had a passion for the purpose that never left him ever until the purpose of his passion was fulfilled. The passion of the young boy Jesus survived adolescence. You believe that? You need to take your passion through adolescence. Let that get you through. Understand that there are changes you go through when you are growing up that you cannot really define them. Sometimes you feel ways that there are no reason to feel that way according to your environment, but you feel that way anyway. You're growing, you're maturing, you're changing. But we want you to understand that the passion of Jesus survived his adolescence. The passion of Jesus survived the full challenge of his teenage years. It remained intact through the individualization of his maturing 20s. And it actually entered over into his life as a young adult. It was fully developed at an optimum level at 30 years of age as he stepped into the final phase of the purpose in his passion. This is my message to our young people today, that you will never let the fire of the passion of your youth go out 
and that you will refuse to let it be extinguished by any of your circumstance. It doesn't matter what your fellow man or your brother or your sister may do. You can make up your mind. I am going to serve God. If you want to serve God with me, we'll do it together. If you don't want to serve God, I'll do it without you. But I have a passion in my spirit to do the work of the Father, the business of the Father, and I will go forward. I'll not be hurt because I'm not first on the list. I'll not be hurt because I'm not selected. I'll not be hurt because somebody overlooked me. I will get back up and go again. I will have the courage to face my hurt and my brokenness and understand that God will always work it to my good. I'm just going to be about the business of the Father. I think sometimes we parents make a serious mistake in trying to keep our children from ever having to hurt. You're, you're doing them an injustice. They need to learn how to deal with hurt. I promise you, if they can't deal with the hurt that comes into their life, you will impair them for the rest of their life. If you jump in every time they have a problem and solve it with them, or you want to shoot everybody that's against what they're doing, or nobody who would help them, you want to cause all, leave them be, and let God help them work through their problem, counsel with them, pray with them, but tell them, you're smart, you're bright, you can deal with it. Reach down, grab a hold of God, get a hold of grit and grace, and go for God. You are about the business of the Father. Don't let circumstance bring you down. But as surely as we keep interrupting the cycle of life for our children, and they never learn to hurt, they never learn to deal with pain, they never learn to work out problems, we're always there right ahead of things to keep them from hurting so they won't will take their hurt. We are hurting them more by doing this than by stepping back and saying, I'm here for you, I'm behind you, I'm praying for you, you're going to be all right, you're going to be okay, God's on your side, you're tough enough to take it. We want a generation of young people to pop out of the hopper on the other side that are tough enough to deal with their own problems. If they have a love affair breakup, they can deal with it. If they have a boyfriend disappointment, they can deal with it. If somebody in church talks about them, they can deal with it. If somebody in the family says something ugly, they can deal with it. If they need something, don't get it, they can deal with it. They can deal with it they, because they're learning how God wants to help them to make a priority and to have determination. And courage and passion, a passion to serve God. Yes. So one come and say, well, they don't treat me right in that class over there. Instead of saying, well, we're going to go get all of them for that. Say, listen, hey, you're going to be in life in lots of situations where you ain't treated right. I'm not saying they're not treating you right. I'm just telling you, you might as well get used to it. Because you're going to be in situations in life where folks are not going to treat you right. They're going to make fun of you about something. They're going to say you're too fat, too thin, too tall, too, you got too short nose, too long nose. They're going to do something. So you just learn how to deal with it, and you're going to be a lot better off when you can say, hey, I don't like that. What they did is not right, but it ain't really going to make no difference because I have a passion for the purpose of Jesus Christ, and I'm going for the goal, and I'm not going to quit. I'm determined. I'm courageous, and I'm passionate. I, I, I've admonished my grandson and my granddaughters and all of them the same thing I'm telling you. I tell my children the same thing. I said, son, you are tempted, I know, to jump in sometime and resolve all the conflicts your kids have in school and with their playmates and their classmates in the neighborhood, but just help them know how to do it. The greatest gift you can give them is how to manage life how to deal with problems, how to handle disappointment, how to handle hurt. That's right. That's right. Persistence, courage, and passion. My challenge in this shift service today is that our FTC youth will remember God now in this part of their life. While it is true that you have no certainty of life, that is, you have no guarantee as tomorrow. Tomorrow is not for sure. 
But listen, them belongs to you. I'm going to say that again. Yesterday is gone. Close the book on it. Tomorrow has not arrived. You can't use it. It may get here, it may not. But you have now. That's why we should always be moved to act in the now. To be sure that we can respond to what's going on now. Because now belongs to you. Now you are young. Now God wants you to be gracious. Now God is calling you. Now His Spirit is striving with you. Now the ministry and the elders of the church are challenging you. Now you have health and strength and vigor in your life. And now sin has no dominion over you. Now is the golden opportunity of your youth. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Let's stand together. I go twice a week to Madison Medical, do counseling at the medical center. It's amazing the number of people that I come in contact with there that tell me that their children are grown and on their own but they're just completely incapable of dealing with life. They have a hard time keeping a job, have a hard time managing their own affairs, have a hard time getting along in relationships with, with their family of origin, their in-laws. They just, and they say, we try to help, and, and they, they now resent our help, and, but we've always done it. And I said, that's the deal. That's the deal. You've always done it. Probably a good place for you to start to go back and apologize to him. Say, I'm sorry. I got into your business so many times. When I should have just backed away and said, I'm here for you, buddy. But this will not be the first time you're hurt. Won't be the last time you're hurt. I love you. But you'll figure out what to do. Pray. I'll pray with you. And understand that what you learn today will be a benefit to you for the longest day you live. Your girlfriend broke up with you. I understand you thought you was going to marry her. This didn't work out. I'm sorry you're hurt, but I can't shield you from that. But I want to tell you, buck up, buddy. Buck up, buddy. You might live to see the day you're so glad she broke up with you. <laughs> but whether you do or not, you got to take it. you got to be tough enough to take it. Deal with it. This is life. I would do you wrong if I tried to make them wrong for doing it or, or take your side against them or say they're bad people. I'm just telling you, learn to deal with it, son. You can do it. You can do it. Best lesson I can give you. I'll tutor you, but you got to deal with it. you got to deal with it. you got to deal with it. Disappointment. I know you wanted that Harley, but you couldn't get it. Mama had a fit. She won't let you have a Harley. But I'll tell you what, it won't be the last disappointment in life. Just deal with it. One of these days you'll be old enough to buy two Harleys. You got the money. But right now, you just got to deal with it. I'm doing you a favor. Let's not render another generation helpless to deal with their problems. Let's bring this generation out of the hopper, hitting the ground, saying, I can do it. I can do it. I'm not going to look for trouble, but bring it on, devil. I've learned a few things in my short life. You throw something at me, I'm going to throw it back at you. I'm, I'm persistent. I'm courageous. I'm passionate. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I will not be deterred. Please remain standing. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for our word from the Lord, from our bishop today. In just a moment, I'm going to call our young people down to the front. And just a moment, and after they've come down, I want our parents and other family members to come down around them uh, in a sign of support and to give them an encouraging uh, prayer and word. Because our young people are, as our bishop said, the church of tomorrow today. They are our apostolic future, and we are eager to invest in them. Because the investment that we make in them is an eternal investment 
for any of our young people here today that are not filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you would like to be, in a moment we want you to come to the front because today is your day and God loves you and FTC loves you and the Lord wants to baptize you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you have not been baptized today, God, we want to baptize you in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And for all of our young people who are already spirit-filled, who have experienced the power of the new birth, and you want to renew yourself in the Lord and recommit to God that you will be persistent and that you will be courageous and that you will be passionate, in a moment we want you to come. Remember that persistent, like our bishop said, is that you want to have that relentless drive that simply will not quit. You've made up your mind that there is no give up within me. And that you also be courageous and have a stalwart drive that will not bow or bend down and not be turned aside by fear. And thirdly, that you will be passionate and have a consuming drive and be committed to a certain and specific purpose in God. You have made up your mind to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Now is your time, and your youth is your golden opportunity. Don't waste it. Don't lay it aside and say, I, I can't do it because I'm young. I'm here to tell you, you can do it because uh, your youth is your golden opportunity. Would you come at this time, all of our young people, would you come to the front? Would you come as close as you can to this altar here? Amen. Today, Sister Renee's fiance is going to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We want them to come at this time as he prepares to be baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Come. All of our young people, there you go. Come as close as you can. Now, all of our parents, grandparents, aunts and uncle, church family, would you come behind these young people and come as close as you can to this altar? In a moment, we're going to pray over them and pray that they would have that awesome power of PCP, of persistence and courage and passion. Come today. Many of you, are, our young people, have been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues. If you have not, today is your day. If you allow the Lord to work on you and work through you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We have a tremendous group of young people. And today, I know we had a little bit longer service, but I'm telling you, it's worth the investment and the extra time to put into our young people. I'm thankful that you stayed in here with us and hung in here with us. And what we're about to do is make an investment into their life and pray over them. I want us all to lift our hands together. And all together, lift your hands and let's surrender to the power of the Spirit in a renewed and a complete commitment to the Lord. Let's pray together and pray for each other, others. Ministers, would you come to the platform and help us pray over these young people at this time? Uh, make up in your mind you're going to serve the Lord no matter what comes your way, no matter what obstacles you face. Uh, you have made up in your mind that you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to be committed to His will and His purpose for your life. Uh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus.
person next to you and let's pray over our brothers and sisters in Christ pray over our young people and thank God for our elders let's pray over them and pray that God will give them strength and encouragement oh God and help them to follow after the will of the Lord let's pray for each other in the name of Jesus lift your voice to heaven James, I, having repented of your sins, it is now my honor to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of all of your sins. time let's clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise for what he's done amen amen God bless you thank you so much for being here we look forward to seeing you Wednesday night at 7 30 and next Sunday 10 a.m. or 1 p.m. God bless you you're dismissed in Jesus name shake hands and be friendly